Hello and welcome to another episode of Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and today is September 6th, 2023. Uh, we had kind of a little bit of a rough market today, but we'll be getting the insights from a couple guests. Uh, first of all, there's our special guest that we have every week, so I'm not sure if he's that special. Arusha Pierce, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. How are you doing, Arusha? I'm doing well, Justin. Always great to be here. <laughs> and uh, Arusha and I just had our Labor Day uh, draft day. So fantasy football is coming into full swing. So that's going to be getting started. Um, and our real special guest is Mark Minervini. Uh, Mark Minervini is returning to the show. One of our favorite guests. Uh, he has been a U.S. investing champion. In fact, in 2021, in the million plus division, he holds the all time record for performance. Uh, he also has a number of books out that he's uh, he's authored. And I mean, yes, they're stock trading books, but they're also about kind of life lessons. So we're going to get into some of that when we talk about the dangers today of just this once. So welcome back to the show, Mark. Hey, thanks for having me. And Arusha, you are, you're special to me as you are too, Justin. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> He's got to be special to someone. <laughs> so, uh, well, let's get right into it, Mark. I mean, you know, I know that you don't follow the indexes as much as you look at the what's happening underneath the surface with individual stocks. But just kind of taking a look at the Nasdaq, of course, we had that follow through day last last week, and now it looks like who knows this this could be uh, could be getting into trouble. I mean, they don't always go straight up. Uh, a lot of times there is a little back and forth action. But there's uh, there's some potential headwinds. So what is it that you're seeing right now in terms of the market action? So I, and I like to just put the the indexes into perspective. And, you mm -hmm. know, first of all, you have to realize that most of these indexes are capitalization or price weighted. And right now, the S&P 500 has five stocks that account for 25 percent of the entire index and 20 stocks make up 42 percent of the index. So mm -hmm. when you see that the, the S&P 500 move, there's. 20 names out of 500 that are moving almost half of the index. So that's not really an accurate picture of the quote unquote, the market, uh, even the Nasdaq's heavily weighted with the, uh, the you know, the mega caps. So you, you, if you're going to look at indexes, first thing you want to look at maybe is equal weighted, but mm -hmm. besides that, you know, I, I want to really use them as a comparison to what's happening with the individual stocks and what the participation is. And right now the participation is, is not very broad. It's not very broad. If you take a look at the uh, NASDAQ right now, you've got about 34, 35% of stocks above their 200 day moving average. Meanwhile, as you can see in the chart here, the NASDAQ is well above its 200 day moving average. So that doesn't mean that the indexes can't rally. It just means you're probably not gonna participate in a way that you might feel that you should be. You see the index is moving higher, but you're not making a whole lot of money or finding a whole bunch of stocks. That would be normal right now because uh, right now the, the, uh, the, we're, we're masking the underlying conditions. Mm -hmm. So and Mark, uh, so I, I guess, you know, the, the question probably all listeners have right now is how much are you investing right now? Are you, are, are you holding a lot of cash or, or do you have a bunch of positions? I, I've got a lot of cash and, and um, we started going into cash actually right off the highs there um, when we had that reversal coming off the highs and went into pretty much 100% cash. And then recently, as we started coming off these lows, a few stocks set up and uh, bought, bought a few names, started adding some names, but very lightly and just sort of putting the toe in the water at this point. Got that follow through day or, or you know, accumulation day uh, coming up there a, a few a few days back and now we did get a distribution day i believe it was yesterday and usually when you get a distribution day within just a couple of days after a follow-through day it lowers the odds of success at least for immediate success you might have to pull back back and fill um and like i said with the participation so thin uh even if the indexes do move up here you, you've got to really put it into perspective and really focus on the individual names and what's setting up mm -hmm. now you mentioned the equal weighted um you know way to measure the indexes. And one of the ones that we look at a lot is RSP, which is the equal weighted S&P 500. And this is painting a little bit of a different picture. I mean, this came up to its 50 day moving average line, got turned away and, you know, looks looks significantly weaker than than the NASDAQ and S&P 500 that are market weighted. 
and I think that's a little bit better depiction of the overall market. You can see if you look to the left there, there's a, there's a bunch of overhead. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think there's a little more formidable, uh, you know, overhead there than you're going to see with those weighted indexes, which are, you know, moving to to higher highs uh, based on, you know, the, the strength of just a small handful of names. Mm hmm. So, Mark, I actually going back to the, the NASDAQ, and this is one thing I remember back when you were talking about this back in 2021, you were talking about narrow participation, but the NASDAQ got so far away from the 200-day moving average. Are you seeing anything like that uh, this time around? Is, uh, is the NASDAQ starting to get a little too far away from the 200-day the and not, seeing, uh, not having enough stocks participating and are above the 200-day? So November 22nd, I believe, was when I issued a sell signal and it was probably the best sell signal that I've ever put out because it was to the day that the NASDAQ topped. It was on that reversal day. Um, you'll see there was, a, there was a big reversal and, and from there it was into the bear market. That was in, in, in part based on the fact that we're hitting new highs. The NASDAQ's well above the 200 day, but there was about 30 some odd, some similar to the percentage now, I think it was about 34% of stocks above their 200 day. I have never in 40 years doing this, I've never seen a market that went up and was, was, was late stage um, and had that type of divergence and it survived and it could, didn't go into at least a good size correction. I've never seen that condition ever work. So that was, again, the, the, now once you go into a bear market and then you come out of that bear market, you can have this type of condition and the market can survive it. What will, will sometimes will happen is you'll start off thin and then right. it'll broaden out and the indexes will actually pull back and correct. But then the participation will broaden out. It, it could work now. Of course, we'd rather see the broad participation. That would be better, right. but it could still work. It's not as ominous, but mm -hmm. it's certainly a, a, you know, a red flag. It's, it's a caution flag and you just have to, you know, a, a, tread lightly right now until you can see that participation starting to pick up unless you happen to be you know in the in the absolute right names I and mean, if you've been in the nvidias and a few of the the mega cap names you've done really well you know mm -hmm. so the, it, it's just going to be a uh, a shotgun uh, i'm sorry a rifle approach as opposed to a shotgun approach so when you're looking at the overall market do you ever take a look at sector etfs and you know are you of the mindset sometimes well there's a bear market somewhere uh because right now I mean, the bull market somewhere, Justin. or a bull, 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 bull market somewhere. Yeah, I guess we should go that way. Uh, right now, energy has been a bear market better. somewhere too. <laughs> yeah, there's a bear market somewhere too. And I mean, in 2022, you know, growth was taking the back seat, and uh, cyclicals were doing very well. So, do you ever yeah. kind of take a look at the sector ETFs as a gauge of where where that strength is, and maybe where you should be devoting your attention? Yeah. So when I when I first started trading about 40 years ago in, uh, in the 1980s. I started in 84. My first trade was Alice Chalmer. Uh, I traded this forklift maker, Alice Chalmer, in 1984. I started off as a quant where I would mm -hmm. form in the market opinion. I try to figure out where the market's going. And then from there, I would look at the groups and find, okay, what groups are the strongest groups? And then look for the stocks within those groups. What ended up happening was I, I kept missing the leading stocks. Mm -hmm. I, I would find that Oh, when I started getting bullish on a sector and, I, and bullish on the market and started buying stocks, all the stocks that were the real great names that had the earnings and had all the characteristics have already gone up. And then I look back and say, wow, those broke out of basis and they looked really good. Why didn't I see them? It was because I, I was busy forming my market opinion. I wasn't looking at the stocks yet. So anyway, I flipped that completely around and I went bottoms up. I said, I'm going to let the stocks lead me to the sectors. And when there's stocks and their sectors acting well, I'll know it's a good market. So, mm -hmm. and once I flipped that around my whole, my whole trading career, my whole life changed. And that's where all the big returns happened. And I never looked back. So that's the way I do it. I, I look at individual stocks. I let them lead me to the sectors. And if there's a lot of stocks working, you know, uh, 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 setting up and breaking out and, and performing. And you would have seen that back when energy, you know, when the cyclicals, there was a lot of cyclical stocks that were breaking out right. before you may have saw it in an ETF. Um, I did buy, if you go back to uh, January, I think it was January 3rd um, last year, you'll see that. Yeah. Right, right there. Actually. I, that's where I actually bought the XLE there. Um, sometimes I'll buy an ETF if it's in a group, that's highly volatile or a cyclical group like the papers, the, 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 the steels, the papers, the deep cyclicals, sometimes the energy. 
Um, even semiconductors, I might, might, I might play the socks if I can get the type of upside and want to limit the risk a bit as far as, you know, the volatility. Um, and with, with, with uh, sectors or groups that have a lot of stocks in them. So it's, the leaders are hard to pinpoint because it's like semiconductor has so many names in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll play that. But usually I don't. I'm looking to get the leverage from the individual stocks. Because if the, if the index goes up 10% or the market goes up 10%, the best stocks could go up 30, 40, 50, 100%. So I want to get that leverage. Right. So I, I remember back in 2021 when you when you were uh, doing the U.S. Investing Championship, you were talking about how uh, volatile the markets were and how you were taking uh, you were taking your gains very quickly and you just kept rotating and rotating. Are you seeing that type of environment this time around, or is this uh, for those few stocks that you have? Are they trending a little bit better? They're trending a little bit better. Yeah, I'm, I'm more I'm more swing swing trading now uh, with a, some bigger moves. Like like for instance, um, uh, TIPT is something, or, or or actually FSLY is a good example. FSLY, um, both of them have recently broken out, but FSLY, and I think that uh, that's skewed. I think. Oh, maybe it's not. Oh no, no, it's not. I'm sorry. Um, you're on a daily there. Yeah, I'll, I'll switch over to the weekly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, you know, recently bought that, you know, just, just not long ago, you can see on that little pullback after it broke out, it started turning up there. Yeah. You probably see it better on a daily. Um, and it, and it's run up about 20% uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. So those, those are much better moves back in, in 21, <laughs> very few stocks were going up more than, I mean, if you got an eight or a 10% move, that was like a monster move. They're all you know, <laughs> breaking up, going up three, four, five percent I started off just trying to capture like eight or 10% moves. And I was like, okay, well, that's not working. And then I went down to five or six. Before you know it, I was practically scalping. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, it was the only thing that would work to, to make some money in the market. The, the crazy thing about 2021 is it was an amazing opportunity because, and this doesn't always exist. There was lots of stocks setting up and breaking out and running up for one, two, three, sometimes five, seven days. So there were a lot of trading opportunities, mm-hmm. um, but but you had to be quick and and keep your losses, you know, uh, relatively tight compared to those gains that you were taking. What I try to always do is sort of gauge what the market's giving me on the upside, and then adjust my my risk accordingly. It's kind of like a pace car, you know. Think of it as you're going around a racetrack, and there's a car in front of you, and you can't out speed the, the pace car you have to mm-hmm. you have to keep a certain distance you know the pace car says hey you know you got to stay five car lanes behind me so he speeds up well you can speed up and still maintain that those car lanes so if it slows down you've got to slow down and still maintain those car lanes those car lanes for me are a minimum of two to one meaning that if if i feel i can make 10 percent, then i'm not going to risk more than five percent and mm-hmm. and so always maintaining at least a two to, to three or four to one uh, reward to risk ratio. So it, bottom line is if there's, you know, if there's smaller gains then I've got to keep my, my stops tighter. If the batting average comes down, I've got to adjust for that. So I'm always controlling that. One thing that I control is the loss uh, that the other stuff you don't control. How, how many times you're right, how much gain you make, you have no control over that. You, all you can do is monitor it, get the feedback and then adjust accordingly and, and use it as a pace car. And that, that's so that and, and in 21, that pace car slowed way down. So I, I had a I had a slow way down. Right. Now, one, one other thing, because you, you brought up Fastly, um, you know, FSLY. And this is something that I mean, a lot of stocks are looking similar to this, where they have this overhead supply from the 2022 bear market that's still kind of, you know, out there and. Is that a concern for you? Is that like, a, you know, if, if we're going to stick with the race car analogy, are those like some potential obstacles on the racetrack that you've got to be be aware of? It, there's, there, when, when a stock makes a decline like this, when you have a stock that's on 80, 90 percent, there's a tremendous amount of overhead supply. So the first thing is you want that overhead to be a, a good distance away, you know, a year or two back. That's number one. You also would like to see it, you know, very explosive coming up on the upside and realize that most likely because you have that, that overhead, you're probably in a situation that's more of a trading situation. So in a stock like that, where I've got the overhead, I, I'm normally selling right into the strength because it's going to run into the overhead. It's going to run into some, you know, some sellers. Um, and, and the likelihood is that, you know, maybe something's, you know, really wrong because you had such a big decline. Um, 
but but yeah, you know that that's that's definitely another risk. I generally don't buy the stocks that look like this as far as longer term. There, there's less supply, there's less decline. Uh, this is what I call an early turn when you're just starting to turn into that uptrend. The 200 day is usually up for maybe a month, two, three months. Um, I prefer it to be up four or five months and be in what I call the confirmed stage two uptrend. Uh, but this this would be more of an of an early turn that's just starting to turn up. Uh, but but I will trade those again. Again, right now, there's the, it's slim pickings. So we're just yeah. trying to you know make money where we can make some money. And if it's not working, then we just step aside and, and wait till there's better opportunities. OK, well, we'll take a break right now. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Mark about the dangers of just this once as a phrase. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Trading Apple. Sometimes you get the bear. Sometimes it gets you. Single stock daily leverage and inverse ETFs from Direction. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's objectives, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus at Direction.com. Read carefully. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, along with my weekly guest, Arusha Paris, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. And our special guest this week is Mark Minervini, welcoming him back to the show. Of course, Mark is an author of a number of trading books, U.S. investing champion in 2021 in the million plus category holds the record there. Um, he was an investing champion 24 years before that too. Um, and, you know, he also has his Minervini private access that he runs. So a lot of great information that he's providing for investors on a regular basis. And right now, I think one of the things we'd like to talk about is uh, you, you, you said some things about like these general rules that you follow. And I guess there are these rules and discipline that's out there but a lot of times there's that temptation to veer from the rules and use the phrase just this once I'm going to do something else. What is what is your feeling on that, Mark? Yeah, you know, in my experience in speaking with traders, coaching traders over the years, I find that very few traders can say that they never have a just this one time moment. Mm -hmm. um, I can say that now and I can say that for the last several decades that I don't have these just this one time moments, which means, you know, just this one time, I'm not going to cut my loss. You know, the company, it's, you know, it's Amazon, it's, um, you know, it's NVIDIA. It's not going to go out of business. I'm going to hold, you know, I'm going to hold here. Or I'm going to, you know, double up on it just this one time. I'm going to add to a losing position and you break your discipline. And usually it's at the worst possible time or eventually the, the worst thing is you have these just this one time moments and you get rewarded. And then it's, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a slippery slope. Now you, right. you make you make an error in discipline and it pays off. So now you think you can get away with that. And that's just setting you up. That's like, you know, the turkey getting ready for the kill before <laughs> Thanksgiving. Um, so, so just this one time I found is never just this one time, you know, it's like, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you're someone who's trying to, you know, uh, uh, quit alcohol or quit smoking, you know, it, you haven't having a cigarette or having a drink, you know, could set off a cascade and it, you, and it very often does same thing with trading. You know, you, you got to get to a point where, you know, certain, certain rules are, are really in stone. And so. I had these just this one time moments for the first five or six years of my trading and I'd, I'd be doing pretty good. And then I'd fall in love with a name for whatever reason, or the market would roll over and I'd get caught down on, on a handful of names and I just wouldn't sell them. And then the loss would get bigger and bigger. And before you know it, I threw in the towel and, and I'm, now I've got a big loss to work my way back from, or I chase stocks up, the indexes would start taking off, but there really weren't many stock setups. So I start breaking my rules and start buying extended stocks, stocks that weren't yet in an uptrend. And and what I found was it was just ne it was never just this one time. So I drew a line in the sand and I said, that's it. There's never, ever going to be a just this one time moment ever again. I'm cutting my losses no matter what. And if they're going to if this market game is going to beat me, they're going to have to nick me to death with the rules. Uh, and from that point, I never looked back. I, I haven't had a losing year since then in, in decades. Um, and that was the big turning point for me. You know, Mark, I also feel like with the, the justice one time, it, it doesn't. I, I think most people can get it down for the the stop losses after you you get hit a few times, right? Especially after like you know my the way I learned it is I rode down a couple of stocks eighty percent, and then I was like, oh, that's why you have that stop loss rule, you know. Uh, but it's more towards the what I've noticed with you is it's more towards the buying, where 
you you've always been very very particular on and very disciplined on it do, if it doesn't look exactly right exactly what i'm looking for i'm passing i'm not and and so that's in many ways another just this one time right yeah, the cutting the loss was the first sort of line in the sand that I had to draw because I like everyone, you know, you, you don't like to lose. And when the stock's down and uh, you have a, it, sometimes it's hard to sell for, for me, it's not anymore. But in the beginning, it certainly was. And I know a lot of people can relate to that. So that was the first thing. Then the second thing, like you, like, like you said, the second uh, uh, discipline that I had a really carbon stone was no what i call no force trades not forcing trades and doing things that you shouldn't be doing that are outside your your mandate or your purview or your your uh you know your your setups uh and, and so i pass on you know hundreds of names thousands of names a year i pass on stocks that go up and they make big moves and um in hindsight you know i probably could have bought it and maybe if i broke my rules it would have worked but consistency is the key you're not going to get consistent results if you don't have consistent input. Your output is only going to be as consistent as your input. And unfortunately, the market will justify just about anything at some point in time. So even your input could be terrible and you'll get good results for a short period of time. But again, it's just setting you up for the big for the big kill because you you whatever what, whatever gets you there is what unravels you. You know, if you if you cut your loss and you keep really small, tight losses, well, what's going to what's going to get you if, if you if you do you know take a big loss is you're going to get a lot of small losses. So that's what you have to guard against. You have to guard against the over trading and trading a lot of trades when things aren't working. Well, now, if you're taking you know big losses and you're holding stocks down, it's going to be that one or two big giant losses. That's going to that's what's going to get you. So if, if you're trying to go for the big move uh, and you're holding these these, you know, these big uh, uh for, for these big long periods of going through big drawdowns, that's exactly what's going to get you. What got you there, you know, what got you to the promised land is going to take you into the into the abyss. So uh, that that's just sort of how I how I view it to to keep things in perspective and know what to guard against. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I think is probably hard for some people is um, you you can almost get. Uh, that confirmation bias, if you will, if you're looking for a reason to justify doing something, there's so much uh, input out there that, you know, people are saying that will kind of confirm what you're saying, you know, what you're wanting to do. You can find an expert that will kind of agree with you. So yeah. what is the kind of benefit to like ignoring some of the experts and not looking for that confirmation of, of breaking rules as opposed to, um, you know, getting as much input as you can from as many different sources? So when I first started trading, there was there was no sources. You know, it was very hard to get any information. There was barely any books. You know, O'Neill's book was one of the first books that was really a great book written by somebody who really knew what they were doing, was a consummate pro and had the results, you know, to, to back it. I was reading books and libraries from written by people who never had any success on strategies that never worked in the first place. Right. And there certainly was, there wasn't even an, an internet or a YouTube or, you know, I remember when I first got email, nobody even had email. Uh, but now you've got to guard against something just the opposite. Now you have information overload. You've got so much information and hundreds of thousands of self-proclaimed experts um, that, you know, you've got people that don't know what they're doing, teaching people that don't know what they're doing. Uh -huh. um, so that's why rules are so important. And, you know, to me, I'm not going to get coached by somebody or, you know, or read a book unless they've got the success and they've, they're, they're proven, uh, over, over many cycles and are truly, truly, you know, a proven, uh, uh a professional. And then from there, you really got to commit to that one style because, you could be pulled in so many different directions and at any given time, some other style will work when yours isn't working, mm -hmm. something else is working, but you can't be a jack of all trades. You're not going to be, it, it takes a lifetime just to get one style and one strategy down. But the, the good news is you don't need lots of strategies. If you become really good at any one of them, whether it's what I do or whether it's you're doing value investing, or you're doing something more like a Bill Miller type uh, style if you're great at that, then that's all you need. You only need that one strategy. So you can you you, you can allow the other strategies to have their their day in the sun, and, and when when you're uh, you know waiting for your uh, pitch to come across the plate.
Right. Now, you talked a little bit about rules and how important those are. One of the things I remember, uh, you know, seeing Bill O'Neill do in real time is he would have a lot of rules, but he would sometimes have exceptions. And usually these exceptions would come from uh, studies where he would say, OK, I missed such and such stock. Let me see if there's a kind of a an exception rule that I should use in order to make sure I don't miss such stocks uh, again. You know, so what is the difference between kind of building exceptions into your rule base and, you know, the, the justice once kind of idea? Well, but, but Bill O'Neill's exceptions were actually rules. Right. <laughs> those were, and that, that was his playbook. And those exceptions became rules. They became uh, mm-hmm. corollaries, you know, mm-hmm. to, so for instance, you miss a breakout, but it comes out of a beautiful base. It's got all the characteristics for whatever reason, you just didn't see it. Or maybe you were just negative on the market because the market was so bad at the time and you weren't really looking very carefully. And now you see, oh, wow, that looked really great. And now the stock pulls back and maybe it pulls back to the breakout or it pulls back to it gets its first pullback to the 50 day. And you've got an opportunity to, to, to play it, not not too far away from that base. And so that's a corollary. That's a corollary rule. I want to be buying it at the optimum spot coming out of that first base if possible. But if I miss it, well, now I have other opportunities. But those that's not breaking your rules. Those are adding play plays to your playbook. And those right. become those become rules. So uh, your playbook's going to expand. I and mean, even my, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years and I do add, you know, little, there's not much though. I have to say, I'm doing pretty much the same thing for the last 30 years, but I've gotten better. I've gotten better. And there's definitely some nuances that I've added um, that have been accretive to, you know, what I do, mm-hmm. but, but breaking rules is when you, you have a rule, you know what you should do and you don't do it. Right. You know, yeah, I mean, there's certain concrete rules that I have. Like, I'm not going to hold a stock down. I'm not going to hold a big loss. That's not going to happen under any circumstance. It doesn't matter what the stock is. It doesn't matter how great the company is, what the quality is, what the reason is. It doesn't matter. I'm out. It gets a certain number. I'm out. I'm, you're never seeing me hold double-digit losses ever unless it gaps against me, and then I'm mm-hmm. taking the next best price. You're never seeing me add to a losing position. Stock comes down, hits my stop, and I'm doubling up. You will never, ever see that happen in my portfolio, not one single time. Like These are things that are, are in, in stone. They're never going to happen. There's never a one, just this one-time moment. Mm-hmm. What about selling into strength? Do people fall into the just one time uh, here, too, when something's actually working, that's trending well, but they're failing to maybe take those profits when they have an opportunity? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when things are working really well, most traders have a tough time taking, taking the gains. And because then they watch, you know, the stocks go even higher and they kick themselves. So I shouldn't have sold. And, and in fact, you, if you look back, you never get the high, you know, and, yeah. and, so, and that's not what trading's about. Trading's about making more on your winners than you lose on your losers and doing it enough times in a period of time to hit your goal, to hit, to, to hit your return. So whether you're whether you're buying a stock that breaks out of a base and goes up 4% and you're taking 2% losses and you do it a thousand times a year, or you're buying stocks that come out of bases and your average gain is 50% and your average loss is 8 or 10% um, and, and you're doing a lot less trades, one could do just as well as the other. It's all a matter of maintaining your risk reward relationship and then enough turnover to get to that goal. That's what it's about. It has nothing to do with what happens after you sell sell the trade or prior to to when you buy it, it's what happens in between your buying and selling. That's what's important. In between where you buy it and where you sell, that that's what's important. So so many people get into Monday morning quarterbacking and mm-hmm. they look and they think the result justifies the means. You know, okay, I didn't buy this stock and it went up and it shot up a hundred percent. I should have bought it. What did I miss? That doesn't mean you should have bought it. It might have not met any of your criteria. There might have been an incredible volatility price that you had to pay for that. Just because it goes up doesn't mean you should have been in it. Uh, So stocks go up all the time that I'm not in Um, and and vice versa. Just because stock rolls over and it it stops you out and it turns around and takes off and goes up. uh, I shouldn't have sold it. No, because that's in hindsight. But if it kept going down, you bet a bigger loss. So how would you protect yourself? You would only know in hindsight. We can't. We have to manage risk in real time. Everything has right. to be done in real time. So, so post, you know, uh, post analysis is great to see. You know, hey, what are my tendencies? Am I doing things right or wrong here? That's great. But to look back and to has the result justified the means and Monday morning quarterback it back is completely counterproductive. 
Mm -hmm. So a lot of these elements, I mean, there's, there's the emotional elements behind it, the ego elements behind it. So what, what kind of turned things around for you? You know, you had these, just these, this once moments and mm -hmm. for the last three or so decades, you don't anymore. What, what turned it around for you? What made you be able to say, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. And, you know, I, I typically don't use absolutes, but you're using absolutes a lot here. Never, you know, you can, you can, you can say it with authority that it's never, never going to happen for you. Uh, never. How did and that anybody, happen? anybody who works for me, Mark Ritchie, who was recently, I, I heard was recently on IBD live. Mark yeah. Ritchie is an amazing, amazing trader, an amazing person. Brandon Hedgepath, who's, who's Mark Ritchie's uh, right-hand man and also works for me. Um, you never, you will never see them do that. Not one single time ever. We can say never, ever. <laughs> you will never see it happen. We, we are these, we are certain things that, you know, are in stone. Um, so but, how did but you get there? The is how did I turn it around? Yeah. What was the bill? So the big moment for me, first of all, I, I took my head out of the sand. That's number one. And I said, you know what? Let's dig into the numbers and see what the heck's going on here. All right. What's my average gain? What's my average loss? What am I doing? looked at all the trades, just like O'Neill and David Ryan said many, many decades ago, uh, to just get out a green pen and a red pen, dot where you bought and where you sold, and take a look. And you're going to find, that's probably your best teacher, because you're going to see your results are the net net. It's the net net of not only the strategy, but your your application or your uh, um, execution of the strategy, because you're, mm -hmm. it's very emotional. So even though you have a great strategy, that doesn't mean anything if you're not executing it properly. So right. when you look at the results, you get the net net of your emotions, everything. It's a it's a complete net net result. And then what will happen is if you if you take your last 50, 100 trades and you plot them, you'll start to see a common denominator. You'll see things that you do over and over and over. Mine were I would buy late. I chase stocks up. I see the stock and then when it would first break out i wouldn't trust it then it get going and then now i'm buying it i'm buying the stock up then it would come in and i wouldn't sell it and then i'd be at a bigger loss than i wanted to be at and i'd hold it and then it, the, the loss would balloon and i end up taking a bigger loss and then i'd sell stocks they went the ones that went up i'd sell them too soon so now i'm taking smaller loss gains than i should take and larger losses than i should take so when i went back and looked at everything i said wow you're constantly breaking your discipline on the downside you're not letting the stocks come to fruition on the upside you're, you're completely inverse your your risk reward relationship is inverse so i had to I, that's the first thing I improved. I said, I'm just drawing a line in the sand and I, at least I can take care of the downside. The upside, I don't have direct control over that, but I do have complete direct con total control over where I sell the stock and cut the loss. So that I drew a line in the sand and I said, no more just this one time moments and certain rules just went into, into stone. They were mm -hmm. etched into, into, into marble, you know, and into granite and they, I never broke them. So, the discipline, you know, really adhering to the discipline and 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 digging into my trading and discovering what my emotions. So just also another thing I like to tell people is that people think, you know, maybe I'm gifted or someone who does really well at something is gifted in trading. But there are no natural traders. Nobody's born a natural born trader. I was an unnatural. I was terrible at it. I did everything wrong. And emotionally was probably the worst possible person to be a trader. Uh, my emotions were so uh, over the top and, and controlled my trading that I couldn't stick to any rules. So the, but the rules are what you have to, you have, that's, that's how you take the emotion out is mm -hmm. with the rules. And, and that, that's what I had to do. It takes time and to trust it. And sometimes you have to blow yourself up a few times. Like Arusha just said, right up couple stocks down 70 yes. 80 <laughs> yeah, right those, those, those it's a painful lesson forever, hopefully you do yeah. it early enough that the the, the account yeah. isn't that big anyway <laughs> my wish for almost every trader is that they blow up right away when so number one they can get it done early and respect risk and that hopefully they do it when they don't have a lot of money um and they that was you know i was poor when i started but I started with a few thousand dollars, but regardless of how poor you are, you could go work a job and make a few thousand dollars. So I could recover from that. You know, if I were to blow up today, it would take me a lifetime to recover what I built. Uh, so, so again, you know, the best thing you can do is, is, is have those difficulties early on and then realize that 
there, it's all risk. It's all risk. You know, when you take a trade, there's nothing but risk at that point. And, that, and risk, risk doesn't manage itself. Your stocks do not manage themselves. You have to manage them. Yeah. And it has to be done in real time. Yeah. So, Mark, uh, you know, at the very beginning of, of the show, Justin mentioned that some of these some, in some of your books, you're, you're, a lot of these lessons are for stocks, but also applying to life. So how have some of these rules, uh, you know, how have you applied them to your life? Well, trading has really done a lot for me to make to believe it or not, I think make me a better person and a better person for myself to, to understand my own emotions and to be able to uh, you know, with uh, create discipline and structure uh, with, with um, um, not having the emotions override. Because, you know, quite frankly, especially as you start to grow your account, and this is a tough thing for some people. They start off with maybe they have ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars, and they have a great market. Now you've got maybe a hundred thousand. You grow that, and maybe you're you're fortunate enough to down the road you're managing millions or tens of millions. Now those decisions get magnified, you know. And now there's a whole nother emo- level of emotion to deal with. Where where once, especially if your success is quick. I, 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 my success wasn't immediate. It was about five or six years. I didn't make any money at all. But once I did get this down, I made a lot of money in a relatively short period of time. So I went from, you know, managing twenty, thirty thousand dollars to managing millions of dollars in a very short period of time. And now I had a whole new emotion. Like, okay, now the stop losses were, you know, tens of thousands of dollars versus of hundreds of dollars. Um, and so I had to get used to that too. And so it, it's a, it's a process of growing. So it helps you grow as a as a as a as a person as well. I might point out too, those of you who don't know, I have a book called Mindset Secrets for Winning. Right. And it's not a trading book, but I assure you it will help your trading and it will definitely help you with the emotions and and having the mindset of uh, you know uh, having a winning mindset. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was thinking of that book and also uh, think and trade like a champion. You know, it's yes, trading is in there, but there's also the thinking part that is uh, as a huge part of it, that mindset, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. You can have the best. I, I've seen people, you know, you, you can give them the strategy, you can give them all the tools. And if they don't have the mental discipline and the emotional discipline, then it doesn't matter because they're not going to follow the rules and they're not going to execute and they're not going to manage the positions properly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to get into some of the stocks that Mark is looking at right now. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Trading Tesla. Sometimes you get the bear. Sometimes it gets you. Single stock daily leverage and inverse ETFs from Direction. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's objectives, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus at Direction.com. Read carefully. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here along with Arusha Pierce, who joins me every week. He is from O'Neill Global Advisors as a portfolio manager. And then, of course, our special guest this week, Mark Minervini, U.S. investing champion, uh, all around great guy with a lot of lessons and, uh, you know, books on how to trade, the mindset. We were just talking about that. And one of the things I thought that was interesting that you mentioned, Mark, was how, you know, there are these people that, you know, start with very little and and build them up. And when we were preparing for the show, you shared a really great story about Mark Ritchie, who you mentioned, and Brandon, who worked with you. Mark Ritchie, as you mentioned, also was just on IBD Live. Great show with him. And Mark Ritchie is going to be joining you with the masterclass that you're putting on soon. So maybe tell a little bit about, you know, his story and, and Brandon's uh, as, as they before they came to work for you. Yeah, so Mark Ritchie is like, you know, in my opinion, sort of the next generation. These guys, Mark Ritchie, Brandon Hedgepath, they're like the next generation of the next market wizards. You know, mm-hmm. uh, David Ryan, of course, was my co-instructor for, I don't know how many years, seven, eight years at the Master Trader Program. Um, uh, we do miss him. He, David is wonderful. Um, and, but Mark Ritchie has a great story. He's worked for me for a number of years now with Brandon. And the really cool thing is that Mark and Brandon, uh, in their very early 20s came to the very first master trader program in 2010 13 Mm -hmm. years ago and brandon actually sold his car to pay for it to get there Um, they took a relatively small amount of money and they turned it into tens of millions of dollars which they manage now and then after that success and being a paying customer of minervini private access for nearly a decade i hired them and they now they work for me and and just wonderful. We have a wonderful relationship and they're just awesome, as you probably saw with Mark Ritchie. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, he's just great. He's a great person and he's a great trader. Um, so so 
uh, Mark Ritchie is the co my co-instructor now, and he just has so much knowledge and and so much experience, and he's just has an amazing performance. His his performance for over it's about thirteen years now. He's only had three down years, and the maximum drawdown in those years has been six percent. One was five, one was like five, the other one was six, um, and he's the S and P is up like two hundred and fifty percent in that period, and he's up like nine thousand percent. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, took took. Uh, Fifty thousand dollars and turned it into I think over twenty million dollars. These guys, so they are really true success stories that um, have a lot to share and a lot to be learned from. Um, so I don't even know what the question was, but <laughs> I remember. <laughs> no, no, no. It was it was the story, but let's also kind of you know follow that up with a little bit more about the master class. I mean, this is this is a yeah. number of days of information, and I mean, a lot of people have said. Uh, I mean, Arusha's been there. It's like yeah. drinking drinking from a fire hose. It is. It is. It, it, it's, it started off just one day, then it went to two, then it went to three with a live trading day. It was it was in person uh, for a better part of a decade. And then when COVID came, we went online and people loved it online because they can attend from their own home and all over the world. Uh, and now it's uh, it's four days of curriculum, one day of live trading and then a couple of days of Q&A during the week. So it's an entire week two weekends and a total of seven days or so. So it's, yeah, it's become, a, it's been, and, and there's a 500 plus page workbook. So there's lots and lots of examples. Mm -hmm. We cover everything A to Z. It's, I, I, I often say uh, it's, it's the greatest show on earth for stock traders. I don't, I don't <laughs> think you'll find anything as comprehensive. So it's coming up in October. I forget the dates. I think it's October. The 14th 15th. and 15th and the, 14th, the 21st yeah, and 23rd yeah. are the weekends. Uh, yeah. And then uh, the website that people can go to for more information. Or stocktraders.com. And it Perfect. and a the number four. Market, my markets, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the number four, right? Right, Mark? Yes, the, the number, number four, four, number stock four traders. stock traders dot com. And I'm I'm really proud you know, Market Smith has been a sponsor for a number of years now. We'll be actually going over Market Smith and how I use Market Smith and screening and so forth. Um, that that's a that's a great day. Arusha used to actually come live and, and go through that. So um, I know we had Scott St. Clair. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be there this year, but we'll have somebody from uh, Market Smith. So that that's an awesome section too. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I do want to. Well, first, I want to say like the online. I feel like it's a little bit more uh, digestible, right? Because it is. There's so much. There, there's so much information that that Mark shares and Mark and Mark and Mark, right? But um, <laughs> they they yeah. they share that uh, sometimes the in in person. Even though I love the in person, it was it, it was so much fun to to be there with everyone. Like, and we, I think what, it was like 12 to 14 hours we'd sit in that room and time would fly by. And I was like, I don't know how Mark is standing up the whole time on yeah. stage doing this. But uh, we, we, it, was, it was really like drinking like a from Pyros. I think for most people, though, the online version, they're more in kind of bite size, but two to three hour kind of modules, right? Yeah. And they, yeah. And made, I spread, out, I spread out over more days and right there in your own home. So it, there's, 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 there's no different element. Live is, the excitement is amazing. And you meet people from all over the world. I think, you know, we've had this year, I think we have people from 77 countries coming. We're close to 80 countries. And wow. every year it's like that. Yeah. But so you said but about standing, you know, I and those who haven't been there, you know, I, I would stand for 10, 12 straight hours wow. talking. And the two things, one is at the end of those 10, 12 hours, I'd say everybody probably tired now you know you, you know you want to take a rest no encore encore yeah, <laughs> yeah. so oh. we're doing something right but yeah. so i would stand so long one year i actually broke my foot my foot broke it cracked in half <laughs> and wow. uh I, I had a broken foot because i stood so long yeah it was just crazy I had my foot swelled up and the next day my wife's like and i had to go back the next day for the oh my for the next 10 hour session and I yeah. stood on it all day and it was like a balloon. And then finally, a couple of days later, we went and they said, yeah, you have a broken foot. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so it's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's from standing so much. One thing that was really special that I definitely missed was that in person, that energy. But you are going to do a one day type type of <clears> event <throat> for the, the Master Trader Program or the Mini Bring You Private Access, right? The, the clients? Yeah, I actually forgot. And it's a good, I'm glad you mentioned that. So what we decided to do, because so many people love to meet each other and, and have that 
the electricity. So we're holding a free event for anyone who comes to the Master Trader program, or if you're a, a customer of Minimum Private Access, you're a platform member. We have on 11 11, November 11th, we're having what we're calling the gala event. It's just a whole day with me, all my staff. Uh, I'm going to have some special guests, and we're just going to talk stocks, answer questions, do product, uh, uh, you know, uh, teachings and, and, and tutorials. And uh, it's just going to be a great fun day to hang out together the whole day. So if you're a client, you, you come for free, and it's going to be in Myrtle Beach uh, in October, which uh, I'm sorry, November, which is a beautiful weather. And we'll we'll you know we'll see you there. And is that the so, same same website to sign up for that? The fourstocktraders.com? No, that first you become a customer, whether you sign up for the and then you'll get information via email. And then you'll get a registration link that allows you to come to that, which you know it's 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 a members only, it's a yeah. custom client client only meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Very so good. like the Share Hathaway um annual meeting. <laughs> the, yeah, the annual yeah. shareholder we're meeting, right? Our, yeah. We're doing our version of that, you yeah. know, for, okay. our, for our members. Yeah. yeah. For our team. Well, you mentioned how uh, you use MarketSmith a lot during the market class. So let's kind of talk about what you've been screening for in MarketSmith lately. And uh, maybe we uh, start out with uh, GLBE. Uh, this is one that came out on your screen. Um, talk to us a little bit about this. I can't say I know a whole lot about it because I just it just came up literally, you know, okay. today or yesterday um, where uh, let me see if I can. There we go. I'll open the screen up a bit here. Um, yeah, you know, there's some of these names here that are, you know, offering some tight right sides and some, you know, pivot buy points that I've recently uh, taken a look at. Uh, GLB is one of them that I'm, I'm just entertaining today looking at. Uh, BTS is another one which, which mm -hmm. just started to move up a little bit today uh, trying to, yeah, it's got a little bit, it's got some overhead supply to the left. So this is a bit maybe premature. Maybe you start a little position here. Um, the mega caps are still sort of, you know, grabbing all the limelight here i think amazon and google look the best out of sort of the fang names uh visa uh we own we own visa uber is actually putting in a little base here and pulling back on the right side for a couple of days now that that may uh that may work here you can maybe buy this as it starts to turn up so actually mark um, maybe maybe let's just like spend a little bit more time on uber because i think this is a pretty good it's starting to form that vcp yeah. pattern here so just walk us through a little bit about some of the characteristics that you like uh about uber and, and remind yeah. people what the vcp is the vcp is volatility contraction pattern so it's just mm -hmm. a series of contractions from left to right where the volatility is getting less and less and, and a classic cup with handle would have vcp characteristics where your that the handle of course would be a a a, a tighter a uh, uh, confluence area after you go through the cup and then you would tighten up. Sometimes you tighten up more than just, you know, one time in the handle and you have a series of those tightenings. And that is, that basically is just the law of supply and demand uh, on display and the stock going through a natural change of hands as that, as that volatility comes down, that's where supply stops coming to market. And then you form what's Livermore called the line of least resistance. That's why when you get these these basing patterns and they get tight on the right side, you'll see they can be very explosive because when they come out of there, there's not much supply left because those those iterations of getting tighter and tighter and tighter, that's what's telling you that the uh, supply is is coming down in the stock. And that's what you want. You want to go into stocks that are in uptrends and you've got institutions in there with an appetite for them, but the, the shorter term supply is not coming to market anymore. So now when that when those institutions step to the plate to buy the stock, it's very explosive because there's not a whole lot of stock for sale. Mm -hmm. And so uh, applying this to Uber, you know, you're looking at uh, a BCP here. It's in, it's just in the process of forming that first contraction on the right side, that pullback right here. So, and, and again, this would be, you know, sometimes uh, in a, with a cup with handle, it'll form up around the old highs. But if it forms down in the mid range, I call it a cheat area. If it forms down in the low, low, lower third, the lower third, I call the low cheat. The middle area, I call it cheat. And the upper third would be a, a classic O'Neill handle. I'll just give you a quick story on this because it's great. Um, so a friend of mine, we we were, you know, we read O'Neill's book. This is in the, in the 1980s. And we're trading cup with handles. And I started noticing that there was a handle that would form sometimes in the lower mid part of the base that wasn't up in the upper one third. It would be sometimes in the lower one third. And I would go in there and start buying it coming out of this little lower handle and then my friend would call me and say hey did you see uh you know so and so xyz i said yeah i already bought it i cheated 
and I, I <laughs> and I I, 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 I cheated before the buy, and I bought it at this buy point, and that became what 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 we termed the cup completion cheat. So once the cup completes, you can then look for these pivot points to form, and sometimes they'll form in the lower one third, the middle one third and the upper one third, and you get multiple sort of like, think of it like uh, an elevator going up to mm -hmm. the 20th floor. Well, instead of waiting for the 10th floor, you might be able to get on the third, the fifth and the 10th, and you can build into your position. And, and the way uh, they say um, uh, necessity is a mother invention. As I started getting more money, I started having a liquidity issue and I started looking to scale into stocks. So I was looking for multiple entry points and trying to get them as uh, you know, as, as, as quickly as possible as they started to turn up and I want to chase them up too much. So that this was sort of a technique that I developed. Um, and then it became, I wrote about it in the book that became volatility contraction pattern. And now it's a vernacular that is all over the world and has become a very popular, uh, you know, term Uber, just real quick on Uber, you know, you can see also, um, uh, you've got some estimates here that you're looking like you might have a breakout year coming uh, yeah, in the block to the left there. I can't really see that too much, but I think it's in the 50s, right? That estimate for 2024? Uh, 162, yeah, 59%. Yeah, 59%. Yeah, so you, see, you see a range of like all losses there, yeah. and then suddenly they're making money, and then that 24, we're looking to accelerate. So this stock is probably discounting the fact that they're expecting some earnings. So you don't really see any – the earnings track record in the last four quarters isn't that good, right, until this last quarter was going against a loss. But looking forward, you can see that – they're, we're expecting some pretty good size earnings. So now th this is going to live or die by the next quarterly results, but it's turning up into a new uptrend. You got a good relative strength, you're forming a little base here. And now, you know, it's just got to make sense here. The stock should work. If the earnings are coming through and that estimate is going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to hit that. Usually those estimates are conservative too. If, if, the, if you get into a new uptrend and, and you see an estimate for the next year, if they start hitting, hitting those numbers, those estimates go up. So it's probably conservative. Um, so, you know, it, it, this may, maybe this is finally where Uber starts getting going here because it's been, you know, kind of a tough sideways stock for a long time since its IPO. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mark, for, for, going, for the, going back to that master trader program, I always like that little lesson that you, you give on the <laughs> analysts being too conservative on the numbers and, and showing real life examples of, hey, this is the estimates before and a year or two later, look how the, the, the actual real estimates came out. Um, and they're always too conservative on the way up and also too conservative on the way down. And on the way down, that's right. exactly right. And that's why sometimes people, a stock will break and they'll see they've got big earnings and they got big estimates going forward. But because the conservative nature of updating those estimates and those earnings, the stock is discounting and it's forecasting and the bad earnings don't happen until later on, until the stock's down 50, 60, 70 percent. That's why it's really important. Uh, David Ryan and I both always say, you know, you buy on technicals and fundamentals, but you sell on technicals. You don't yes, wait for the yes. fundamentals to erode. You, if, if the stock gets in trouble, you, you got to get out because usually, you know, the st stocks take the stairs up and the elevator down and the, the fundamentals usually lag on the way down. Since you're talking about earnings, um, what what is your strategy for when an earnings uh, call is coming up, earnings report is coming out? Uh, are are you generally holding through earnings? Uh, do you have to have a certain amount of cushion, or what's what's your strategy for earnings? I'd like to hold through earnings, but I don't want to hold through earnings, particularly a big position, if I'm not at a gain, if I don't have a profit. We look at implied volatility. Uh, right. in, the, in the bigger names, you'll get a pretty good picture of the expected volatility. And you can see uh, we have a formula that we use and, and um, you can get a good idea. Like if Netflix has come out with earnings, we'll get a good idea. It's going to move maybe you know, 8 percent in either direction. So with that scenario, you know, I want to be at at least maybe in, you know, an 8 six, seven, eight percent gain. So I've got some cushion. And even if it blows up, at least I've, I've cushioned some of that. So what I'll buy stocks sometimes right before earnings. But if they don't run up and give me a gain, I've got to pare it down to a, a small position and and uh, uh, trim off the risk that way. Or uh, or, or I'm going to just you know sell the stock and not go through the earnings. I don't want the overnight risk. And if it does run up, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'll finance the risk. So I'll sell a portion of the position, maybe sell half of it. And now, you know, if the stock's up 10%, I sell half. Now I've got that whole 10% gain to a raise and a 10%, let's say a stop of 
I've now financed that. If it comes all the way down and gets clobbered, erases the whole 10% gain and takes out the stop at 10%, basically a 20% reversal, I break even on the trade. I don't have a full position, but at least I have a position and I can go through the earnings. So that, that's just one, one sort of middle of the road technique, if you will. So Mark, let, let's talk about a couple of stocks that uh, where the market might be forecasting to the downside, a couple of stocks that are uh, shorts. Uh, uh, maybe we'll talk. Uh, maybe we'll start off with Wingstop. So Wingstop, I, I shorted it just a few days back, um, and it's it's rolling over here uh, pretty nicely. Um, and and here's a perfect example. You know, you see those estimates to the left. They're not huge, but they're positive. I would be willing to bet that if you look at this a year later you'll probably see that the actual earnings, maybe not this year, they'll probably come in close to it, but that next estimate for 2024, where they're expecting, what's that, two? 253. 250, uh, I'll bet you it won't be anywhere near that. And the estimates will then be revised because the stock is, is, is forecasting that now, especially if it really gets into trouble here. You can almost be certain that those estimates are conservative at this point. But this is a typical, uh, what we call a ledge, where you just break down, you break down below the 200, and then you can't rally. And you you just move straight sideways with no rally, a very like a, almost a square square look at the bottom. Um, that, when, 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 when uh, we start to roll over from that pattern, that, that's, a, that's a classic short. That's, that's one of my textbook shorts. Mm-hmm. And, and, and usually over, uh, RS will go from like 90 and then undercut 70, which is sort of the first uh, uh, short sale li- uh, uh, flag, if you will. Uh, uh, and then if it gets below 50, you start getting where now, you know, you're 30 relative strength, you know, 20s in the 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. And when you're shorting, are you uh, how do you set your profit level where you take profits? And also, uh, do you look at certain liquidity uh, elements to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, getting put potential uh, short squeeze that could, could run you in. Yeah. Good points. There, there's a number of things to say about shorting. Let me start off by saying this. I'm not really great at shorting. Luckily, I haven't had to be. Uh, if you go mm-hmm. back over my 40 year career, less than 1%, probably way less than 1% of any wealth that I've created from the market has been from the short side. And I was short on 9-11, <laughs> a big position on 9-11, the, probably the best you know time you could be could have been short. Uh, but it, all in all, it has accounted for less than 1%. So I've made almost all my money on the long side. I short occasionally, this is really a textbook uh, situation here. Uh, on rare occasion, it's almost more of a uh, for fun <laughs> for me mm-hmm. than it is uh, a profit center. Uh, but shorting has a lot of risk and it has more risk than ever. When you get into these Reddit meme situations where, you know, it's unlimited, the stock can gap up 500%. So you do have to realize that there is a, a, an element of risk there that could rear its head at some point. And position sizing is so important at that point where you, you're definitely going to not want to put your whole account in any stock short because of that overnight risk if you're holding overnight. Um, So, and the other thing too, is a stock can only go down a hundred percent, you know, a stock can go up 80,000%, a hundred thousand, we have stocks like, you know, Amazon that made 80,000% moves over, over a decade or two, a stock can only go down a hundred percent. And that may sound like a lot, but a a short, usually a good short sale profit is, you know, 20, 30% is a big move on the, on the short side. Um, right. So like, for instance, this stock here, I shorted it and I actually covered half of it today up around 8% just simply because I have an 8% stop on it and I've sort of financed my risk now. So now if it stops me out, I break even. So right now my, my situation is I either make money or I lose nothing. So mm-hmm. if you put yourself in a position of making money or losing nothing, you're going to make a lot of money if you can constantly, and I call this improving your worst case scenario. I always, the first thing I want to do when I get in a trade I, the first thing I do is set, set my stop, manage the risk, have a line in the sand. But once the trade starts working in my direction, I want to improve that worst case scenario. So moving that stop up to either break even or maybe financing my my stop by selling a portion of it. And if the stock goes up more than what the stop is, you could sell less of it. If it goes up 20 percent, now you could sell a, a lesser portion and still finance that risk and free roll the trade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And should we you go know, over one more? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
lot. I know I'm throwing a lot out here quick. No, no, no. That's, that's, that's great. That's great. We love it. Um, time, but we go over all this over, I don't know, 35 hours of curriculum and seven days at the master trader program. And that's where this is, the, you know, with hundreds and hundreds of examples, yeah. but I'm trying to give as much as I can in a short period of time. The, 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 the teaser. Well, I wanted to uh, go back to the stock BTS um, and, and mostly because this is uh, an IPO and, you know, we, yeah. we've kind of, um, not had as many IPOs lately. It's um, you know kind of kind of dried up there. And I mean, there was all the all the spacs uh, from from before and everything. So, do you handle IPOs differently? Or I'm not sure. Is, is this an IPO? It might be a spinoff. Or is it a spinoff? Maybe. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, it, yeah. regardless, do you do you handle do you handle IPOs differently or spinoffs or SPACs? I love um, IPOs. I don't, I don't buy on the IPO. I wait for what we call a primary base, the first or second base after an IPO, buyable base, of course. That was a base right there, but you really didn't have much of a buy point on the right side because it ran straight up. So the first buyable base, this still looks like it needs work. I, I still, you know, I'd be careful here. This is going right into supply to the left side. You got immediate supply. Um, had a good start today. You see the volume was up um, on, on, a, on a down day, you know, tough week so far. So it's acting pretty good, but I would expect this probably still to move sideways, tighten up, and you look for that volatility contraction. That's what you want to see. You want to see this. But, but a lot of times you know, I'll put these stocks on and, I'll, and I'll, I'll live with them for a while and I'll watch them and I'll learn about them. And then by the time they get to the buy point, you know, I really I know their character and I've learned a lot about the business. Mm hmm. Right. So it looks like this, uh, Ali's, Ali's kind of in the background telling me that this is a spinoff of Jeffrey's Financial Group. And, you know, as the name suggests, you know, Vitesse Energy, uh, it's, an, it's involved in the acquisition, investment and monetization of non-operated oil and gas, uh, working interest royalties, um, all of that and the back and shale field. And um, yeah. so, so that's, that's one of the things the going for I'm even looking at this is because I, it might, it might, we might be getting some sympathy from the from the energy stocks moving. And right. when I saw when I saw the energy, you know, energy in the name, um, I said, OK, let's take a look at this. Maybe maybe this energy move will pull this up with it. It's coming out of a base. Um, so it's it sort of, uh, you know, th that's one of the reasons what led me to it. Mm -hmm. um, and just real quick liquidity. Uh, so this looks like it, you know, trades a little bit thin, uh, especially given the size that you're dealing with. Is, is this something that you can get into easily or? Um, so how do you I'm, deal with slow liquidity? Yeah, I'm okay with buying very thin names. I just buy less, okay. <laughs> you know, and sometimes I'm buying, you know, 500 shares or a thousand shares of a stock that trades a hundred thousand shares a day. Um, there, and there's times where I've bought, I've put my personal uh, account, I've bought, taken a $10 million position, but it would be in something like, you know, Goodyear tire, you know, or maybe an Amazon, uh, that has a liquidity. So I, I'm just, I'm adjusting my, my position sizing and my risk to the liquidity. Yeah. Perfect. Well, hey, Mark, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Thanks for giving that little teaser uh, for the for the masterclass, giving people a taste of what they can learn over that seven day period. It's always a pleasure having you on and we'll have you on again, I'm sure, soon. OK, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, that'll wrap it up for us this uh, this episode. Uh, tune in next week. We're going to have Miss Schneider on. Uh, Miss Schneider is from Market Gauge and she does a lot of work on commodities She's been on IBD Live a couple times. Uh, really interesting take on uh, the markets, and we always learn a lot from her. So we're going to be very happy to welcome her to the show. And uh, that's going to do it for us. Thanks a lot for watching. We'll see you next time.